So I want to start this video with a confession. I like to think I'm some sort of hardcore beer nerd. I drink a lot of local beers, I attend beer festivals, and I spend hours on end writing about beer and sitting in a room recording my thoughts. I feel like I have a rather long resume of beer cred to back me up. But this beer right here, this is my first New Belgium fat tire. Mmm. Mmm. Like, how does that even happen? How does a hardcore beer fan who has tried hundreds of unique beers from across the US and all over the world never had this beer right here, one of the bastions of the craft beer movement? Well, when I saw the Instagram beer hashtag flagship February, I started to do some research and I figured out that a story like this is actually incredibly common. Many drinkers in my generation love to try all sorts of different beers, but have some huge holes in terms of very common offerings that they've just never tried. It seems millennials like myself are a particularly promiscuous generation when it comes to our beer choices. So in honor of Flagship February, I'm going to review four flagship beers from the craft beer world. Some are new experiences for me, like this fat tire, and others I am revisiting to remember what makes them, and the brewers that brew them, so damn good. And while we do that, we're going to do the usual beer by the numbers thing, and talk about how flagships really impact the world of craft beer economics in general. So, grab yourself a flagship brew like this fat tire, pull up a chair, and let's get started with talking about flagship beers, and dive into this fat tire a little more. So, you know, already on the nose, if we're starting to review this thing, I can tell you that I, I really can't just stop sipping it. Like, it's one of those beers that you get it in your hand and you, you know, you take that first sip and you, you just want to keep going back for more. And I think, you know, isn't that really what a, a flagship is about? It's a beer that a brewery can consistently produce that really brings a lot of the great things the brewer is trying to do forward in all the other beers they try to do. You know, this particular beer from New Belgium is is sort of an amber, kind of based on a, you know, Belgian style of beer. And, you know, it's called Fat Tire because the founder of the brewery um, loved to bicycle around Europe, trying all the different brews, and he especially fell in love with the brews of Belgium. So he came back to Colorado, started New Belgium Brewing, and bam, was really hit some, some home runs, knocking it out of the park. So, you know, on the aroma of this, you know, fat tire amber, you know, you get a lot of malt. It's not really a lot of the, the hops. Yeah, not getting a lot of hops, but what I am getting is that that slight hint of Belgian yeastiness that you would expect from any sort of uh, a big Belgian beer fan. You know, it's not exactly over the top. It doesn't really hit you in the face, but it's definitely there. It's definitely there on the back end. And I could see why this would be a great beer you would want to drink if you wanted to introduce someone to a Belgian style beer with a flagship ale like this. So, you know what? I, I'm I just need to get back at, back into this. Need to take another sip, so let's go. You know, it's got a dense white head with um, actually fairly fine bubbles. Mm. And on the taste, you definitely do get do get that roasty, toasty malt flavor. You know, it's not super sweet, but there's definitely a subtle note of sweetness in there. And you definitely get a little bit of that yeast flavor not a ton of character like you'd expect in, in like a like an over the top, you know, traditional saison. But you know, definitely a definitely a solid ale. Um, it's very clear and very beautiful. Um, absolutely gorgeous to look at. And I just love how the lacing just works its way around my glass here. I I, I always appreciate good lacing from a beer. That's just sign of a, a of a good quality beer um, for most ales anyway. Mm. And like I said, I am uh, I'm I'm pretty impressed. Like, you know, it's it's not blowing my mind. It's not it's not exactly groundbreaking here, but 
you know, when you want to, you want a beer on a hot day, you know, you're going to grab one of these. Like it's, it's definitely a delicious, delicious brew. Um, and I, and I really, really, really enjoy it. Mm. You know, it's a shame I haven't had this, uh, till today. I'm, I'm actually a little bit sad that I haven't, haven't had this beer before. Um, yeah, I would highly recommend this beer. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about flagships in general in a minute here. Um, but if you're looking for uh, something you may never have tried before, maybe you're like me. You just you just never picked it up. You always went for a pale ale. You always went for a pilsner. You got distracted by a beer that, that had a ton of cool ingredients or was from a hip brewer at the time. And you just kind of let you just kind of let fat tire fade in the background. Don't skip it. Please go out and get it. And mm, and now that I've plugged this gaping hole in my beer knowledge, let's talk about what a flagship beer actually is and try to define what flagship means in the first place. I'm going to finish this up and I'll see you in a little bit with another beer. Cheers. Personally, my favorite definition of what a flagship beer is comes from David Howard, the head brewer at Wachusett Brewing Company. The best beer we can possibly make and still sell at volume. It may never win a medal, but it allows us to continually move ahead. This definition is great because it's got a lot of layers that really capture so many different great beers out there. I think that line about still selling at volume is the key. A flagship beer has to be something that generates some really dependable revenue for your brewery. Aside from a few much hyped beers and expensive stouts, beer is a pretty low margin product. Most small businesses in the US shoot for profit margins around 30% per sale because they're not going to sell as many things as somebody like Walmart or McDonald's. And even with higher prices, and those margins are still tough for many small businesses to break even after overhead and labor costs. Beer is a product that most adults can afford, meaning that the margins for craft brewers are oftentimes pretty low, under 10% of beer. This means that in order to make a profit, brewers have to sell a lot of beers. Luckily, Americans are a pretty thirsty bunch for craft beers, but selling at volume is why flagship beers are so important. They're the financial lifeblood of most breweries and keep the money coming in to keep the beer flowing. The second part of that definition is also pretty important. It may never win an award, but it allows us to continually move ahead. Flagship beers are meant to have mass appeal. They're meant to taste good to most people and not be too extreme or offensive. They're generally not the best beer you'll ever have, but a flagship has to be something that's consistently good and appealing to casual beer drinkers and hardcore beer nerds alike. All right, another day, another flagship beer for flagship February. Today, I wanted to pull something pretty old school, so I went with uh, probably one of the oldest craft beers out there. I know everybody talks about about like Anchor Steam beer and things like that. Uh, but when I think of it, um, I think of somebody who really kicked off a lot of the craft beer movement. And that of course, is the classic Sam Adams Boston Lager here. And this beer is just a real classic brew. And you know, regardless of what you think about Boston beer today, I think one of the big things is, is that uh, Every craft brewer kind of owes Boston beer, and I suppose Boston lager, uh, a little bit of a, of a debt of gratitude, you know, because, you know, their founder, Jim Coke, went out when there wasn't any craft beer infrastructure. There wasn't any lobbying group helping him out. He just took a good lager recipe and went out and sold it, got it done through a contract brewery, and... He built a craft beer empire, an empire that proved to bankers and investors that, you know, craft beer was the real deal. You could trust a craft brewer to get you a return on your investment. Um, that's all because of this this flagship beer right here. Um, so I'm kind of excited to dive into this today. I've had it only a few times in the past. Uh, you know, I'm a bit of a, a millennial drinker, so that means I'm pretty promiscuous when it comes to my brews. So let's get a nose on this thing. Mm, and this nice Pilsner glass, we got a lovely P 
pillowy head on here, poured out very, very clear, golden, exactly what you would expect from a kind of beer of the, the mid to late 80s, you know, really needed to be a macro killer, really needed to be something that could, could easily win people over. So on the aroma, you know, normally you, you take like a Bud Light, a Budweiser, Miller High Life, um, you get a little bit of malt on the aroma, maybe a little bit of hot flavor, but other than that, there's not too much going on. You know, you smell this beer, and you get like a like a hint of those uh, American style lagers, but you know, really, ev everything is turned the dial up just just that one little more notch. Not to say that it's like it seems like a really craft lager that's trying to showcase a particular hop or trying to be you know, kind of malty and delicious. No, it, it's it's just, you, you take that American lager formula, you just turn the dial up just a little bit. That's that's what you get on the nose here. You get a little bit of biscuity malt, a little bit more hops. But you know what? It's a beer that uh, makes you thirsty when you smell it. So I'm gonna dive into this thing. Cheers. And yeah, once you get into it though, you really, you really do kind of get a distinguished flavor from another American lager. Um, you know, normally, normally the the American lagers are very light across the palate. You know, this one is, is light, but it, it's starting to lead towards a little bit of a medium body already. So, you know, just on the mouthfeel, you can already tell that there's there's something different about this beer. This is this is not. Uh, the original Budweiser. This is not, you know, a hams or anything like that. This is something different. A little bit of hop bitterness comes through. Definitely still went with those European noble hops, um, but not a ton of hop character, but you do get some malt, you get a little bit of corniness, um, a little bit of biscuit, but you know, it's just a clean, easy drinking beer. And that's exactly what it was meant to be at the time um, when this flagship brew really kicked off um, a, a great beer empire. It was something that was meant to draw people into a new world of craft beer, a world that they hadn't really seen or taken a lot of time to dive into before. This was a beer designed to pique people's interest. It was designed to get them to try the Revel IPA designed to get them to try an Oktoberfest. You know, give them a little hint of, of some more quality. Give them a, give them a taste of, uh, of what they could get into if they were to dive further into the, uh, into the Sam Adams and Boston beer portfolio. So with that in mind, you know, this beer really isn't anything to write home about. You know, I enjoyed the fat tire a lot more personally, but I can see why this beer really works as a flagship product. It it piques my interest. It makes me want to go try more of the Boston beer portfolio. It makes me interested in taking the next step into brewing. Mm. So we've looked at an amber. We've looked at a lager. Uh, let's try to figure out you know what styles really make a great flagship beer. We'll do that next. So when breweries think about what recipes to hone into their flagship products, I think there is one thing they have to consider over any other. What style is this beer going to be? Because we know flagships have to have a lot of mass appeal, it's best for brewers to stick to styles and recipes that a lot of people like. For the longest time here in the US, the beer style that dominated the craft beer scene was the IPA. So for a while, a lot of flagship beers were on the hoppy side to distinguish themselves from macro lagers. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter legalized homebrewing in the United States, and it's not really a surprise that two years later, Sierra Nevada popped up with a beer that featured American hops that quickly became really, really popular. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is a great beer that started changing the minds and hearts of drinkers that tried it. It heavily featured the pretty new Cascade Hop, one of the central hops in American brewing today. 
Hoppy beers were here to stay, and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale was one of those beers that really kicked off that movement. So it's no surprise that it's one of the most commonly cited flagship beers on the market. As the craft beer scene grew, flagship beers began to evolve away from lagers and pale ales. We already looked at Fat Tire Amber that ignited the Colorado beer scene, which along with the Saves On gave Belgian style brewers two great options to promote as their flagship brews. But as US drinkers developed ever more varied palates, many different styles of ales began to represent brewers as flagships. Wheat ales, Hefeweizens, and even more amber ales. And some brewers even use easy drinking porters and stouts to best represent their brewery. But besides ever more varied styles represented, flagship beers are also serving a great purpose for breweries. They tell great stories that allow brewers to connect with their consumers. We started this video with Fat Tire, which is the result of New Belgium's founder heading to Europe with one passion, cycling, and having his mind open to a totally novel beer culture to him, and coming back to Colorado with a passion to homebrew and eventually open his own brewery. Boston Lager harkens back to an era before craft beer infrastructure existed at all. No banks were lending to startup breweries, no lobbying groups were helping brewers with networking, and you needed to have a macro beer killer front and center to even have a chance in most markets. But through all that adversity, it proved that a craft brand can grow, prosper, and even reach the promised land of being a publicly traded company. Flagship beers allow consumers to connect with brewers, not only by talking about how good the beer is, but by really digging into the inspiration behind it. So the next time you head to the bottle shop or swing into your local brewery, ask about the inspiration behind the beers at the top of the menu. I think you'll find that flagships have a lot more to offer than just liquid gratification. Okay, y'all, I cannot help myself. I have to do two in one day because I'm having so much fun uh, just getting into these flagship products. So next up, we have a beer um, that's a little a little bit weird in terms of a flagship because uh, as, as kind of discussed, you don't get a lot of porters and stouts really leading the charge for a brewery. Um, but this beer was so good and so successful after the first time it went to market uh, that the, the brewery just had to run with it. And I'm, of course, talking about Left Hand Brewing's Nitro Milk Stout. Now, this is a beer I'm not, you know, I'm not even sure they would consider it their flagship, but it's definitely, without a doubt, their most famous beer. And I'm pretty sure it's their best seller. So that kind of makes it a flagship anyway. Um, but this beer is one of my favorites, and I absolutely highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't had it yet. Um, it's, it's fun. It's fun the whole way through because not only, you know, do you get a great beer, but you get a great beer experience because even on the cap, it gives you a hint of what you're supposed to do. Keep it cold and pour it hard. So that's right on the cap. So let's, uh, let's not let it warm up any longer. Let's dive into this thing. And so I'm going to pour it very aggressively into a rather large vessel that's bigger than the uh, amount of beer itself. And I just let it all run out slowly vertically like that and as you can see we get that beautiful nitro pour straight out of the bottle and that's actually one of the really cool things about this beer is because not only does it showcase a great beer by left hand which i got uh the great privilege of going to about a year year or two back but um it also shows off a really cool piece of beer technology which is how to get a nitro beer into a bottle which is something I can get into probably in a different video, but um, it's really cool to see, you know, sometimes you have a, a beer that's designed to pique interest in a brewery. Uh, this certainly does that, but it also piques my interest in brewing technology too. Like, how do you get a nitro beer in a bottle? Does it taste as good coming out of the bottle with a really hard pour like this? I mean, already we see a beautiful silky black stout here has a lovely head of, you know, medium to fine bubbles on here, but leaves a nice lace. And, you know, it's probably not as fine as if it were on nitro tap, but, you know, it's definitely got a big, puffy nitro head on here, straight out of a bottle I pour right out of my fridge. So that's really cool. 
on the nose, you know, get the classic stout maltiness, but a lot of sweetness on there too. Just, just a ton of sweetness coming from that lactose sugar to make the beer really creamy. Mm, I can't help myself, I'm going. Mm. Yeah, this beer just always impresses me. So got a pretty standard kind of stout um, malt bill here. Um, you know, you get your hints of chocolate, maybe just a little bit of coffee bitterness, but mostly a lot of dark chocolate flavor. Um, a little bit of sweetness coming through from the lactose, but it's not like overpowering. This, this, you know, you might consider it a dessert beer, but it's definitely no crazy Omnipolo or, or Omnipoyo or, or Coco Jesus or anything like that. You know, it's it's just, it's still a stout. It's got a little bit of extra sweetness. Mm. But where it goes right is that creamy mouthfeel. And it's and it's amazing to me because they really do almost perfectly recreate a nitro tap experience right in your home, which I, I still think is a phenomenal thing for them to be able to do. And probably why this beer is so popular. I know that they have put a lot of time, they've invested a lot of money into researching how to make the how to bottle this beer in such a way that you can have the nitro tap experience here at home yeah it's just a really solid beer um that really fine can't call it carbonation i guess i call it nitrogenation is that a word ah whatever um yeah the, the nitrogen bubbles really lend that creaminess and kind of a softer feel overall to the beer which Again, it's just a really, really, really well done. And yeah, this tells, um, this beer tells a story, not only of a brewery that, you know, didn't start out with this beer, but ended up making an absolute smash hit that became their flagship, not when they started, but after they had gotten major distribution, it became incredibly popular. Uh, but it also tells the tale of how you know, this brewery pushed the envelope when it came to brewing and packaging technology. Mm. And that's part of what flagships do. They tell a story. Um, and that's and that's what I really like about them. Uh, I, you know, that that's, that's the brewer trying to put their best foot forward for you right away. So, mm. I do have a little bit more to say on flagships. Um, including, you know, why I'm, I'm doing this video in the first place. So let's get to that. And I still have one more beer to review too. Um, and this next one, I think ev everybody on the beer tube community seems to, uh, seems to enjoy it. So, uh, we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Cheers. I'm gonna just keep rolling on this. So why is flagship February even a thing? If flagships are so important and they tell great stories and they keep money flowing into a brewery, why even call special attention to them in a month in, a f in the first place? Well, frankly, my generation, the millennials, are putting pressure on flagship products because we love to try so many different beers. In the golden age of craft beer in which we live, younger drinkers are always looking for something new. Here are just a few stats that show how much variety millennial drinkers demand. Nearly half of craft beer purchases made by millennial males include brands they have never heard or seen advertised. Think about that. As a brewer offering a flagship product, not only do you have to compete with every other beer a consumer has heard of or drank before, but that's only half the business of their purchase dollars because they value beers they've never heard of over a recipe that you've spent years honing in on and refining. Among weekly craft beer drinkers, millennials try 5.1 brands per month, and 15% of those drinkers are up in the 10 plus different beers a month range. The generation that picked one beer and stuck to it is getting older, and this new group of drinkers is completely different. Many of them want something new almost every time, and the fact that they've had a beer before is almost a turnoff for some of the most extreme variety seekers. With 7,000 plus craft breweries in the US, it's enabling drinkers to be more promiscuous than ever. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a bad thing. 
It's just different, and it makes flagship products less important than they were in the past. Okay, y'all, I can't really help myself. I need to do one more of these flagship February reviews, just because I'm having I'm having such a good time doing these. I, I really I really just want to keep diving into different flagship beers, and this one I think was kind of the toughest challenge for me to pick. Um, because I, I needed to give the Pale Ale and the IPA some sort of representation within the flagship beer uh, February month here. Uh, but it was really hard to pick. So many great breweries have Pale Ales or IPAs leading the charge for them. Uh, but when it really came down to it for me, um, there was one Pale Ale that kind of told a little bit of a different or unique story. You know, there's a lot of brewers that come out with an IPA, a pale ale that's just, you know, very popular right when they come out, right when they open their brewery, you know, they, they lead strong with a good IPA. That's especially important here in the US beer scene. But, um, but every once in a while, it takes a brewer a year or two or a decade plus to come out with a flagship IPA. And, the, one of these strange cases happens to be the Founders All Day IPA. Now this beer didn't come out until 2012, I believe. So, you know, decades passed when Founders started, but this beer instantly became their most popular. It had double digit growth year over year. And, you know, it, it's become a crazy popular beer. And honestly, it's, it's one of my favorites. So, this is kind of a, a weird, weird new flagship product that, that came into a brewery's life a lot later. So let's pour this thing out and get into it. So it is marketed kind of as a session IPA. It's only four point, what's it say on here? 4.7% ABV. So pretty, pretty light on the alcohol for an IPA. It pours out um, a lovely, lovely golden color with a, you know, kind of medium bubbled head on there, but looks absolutely delicious. And immediately when you open the bottle, you just get a whiff of hops, you know, so, mm. yeah, you get that kind of classic West Coast sort of hop profile. Um, you know, the classic American hops are all there. A little bit of pininess, a little, little hint of citrus. We're not going over the top with that. But yeah, and, and just a little bit of earthiness too. And maybe just a tiny bit of malt on the nose, that little hint of malt sweetness that still lets you know that this is um, gonna be uh, probably a balanced brew. So cheers, let's get into this one. Mm, and yeah, so it, it's definitely got all those great hop characteristics, that earthy bitterness kind of leaves hangs out on the back of the palate after you take a sip and the aromas just fly through your mouth and up into your your nose so you can really experience them you know just a just a little bit of a malt backbone it's not super strong it's it's there just to provide that little bit of balance but you know mm, i kind of hate the word crushable because i don't really know what it means uh, in terms of describing beer. Um, but they're not kidding when they say you can drink this thing all day because, you know, it's not particularly alcoholic. It's really tasty, very easy drinking, easy going beer um, that just tastes really good. Mm. And, you know, obviously they were trying to capitalize on kind of the rise of session beers that was going on back in kind of the mid 2000s which is why this beer became so popular in the first place. Um, it was one of the one of the early ones that was really widely distributed. Um, but this beer has absolutely taken over in terms of brewery volume. I'll get a little bit more into that in a second um, because a lot of people have a feeling that flagship beers are dying. So let's take a little look into that question. Are flagship beers dying, or are they still healthy and strong? Are the promiscuous millennials killing it? We'll find out. Cheers. So ultimately, the question brewers and drinkers are grappling with is this. 
Are flagship beers dying? Well, I've given a lot of positive reviews today, so I won't really beat around the bush here. The answer is no. In just the same way it would be impossible for a craft beer to totally kill off Bud Light, the sheer volume of flagship beers represent is probably a lot more than you think. Bell's Brewing in Michigan is known for their specialty brews and seasonal releases, like their delicious Oatsmobile Ale. And although they have a lot of really regular specialty releases, 79% of the brewery's volume belongs to just two beers, Oberon and that instant classic Bell's Two-Hearted. Bell's volume distribution looks something like this, and trust me, they are not an outlier at all. Goose Island IPA volume grew 250% in 2017, long after growth explosions like these have slowed way down in the beer world. Founders All Day IPA that I just reviewed only debuted in 2012, but since then it's seen double digit growth year over year and now accounts for over 50% of Founders volume. And probably the most extreme case belongs to Allagash Brewing and Allagash White that accounts for 80% of that brewery's volume. 80% all devoted to a single beer. So no, flagships are not dying, but that's not to say brewers aren't feeling some frustration around that slight decline. Here's a great comment from the beer subreddit I want to read for you. It's pretty disheartening as a brewer that the idea of refining and honing a recipe is pretty much dead. You are constantly being asked to brew wilder and wilder recipes with less room for smaller scale trials or refinement. Personally, I believe the new 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 beer treadmill has negatively impacted beer quality across the board. It's tough to get a recipe spot on on the first try. Another user later went on to tell a story that, you know, they gave a customer one of their favorite flagship beers and the customer really enjoyed it. And so when they came back up and said uh, that they really enjoyed it, the, the brewer asked, all right, you want another one? And the customer said, no, what else you got? Totally disregarding the great experience that they just had. Mm. You know, that comment from the beer subreddit really provided a lot of food for thought for me. Uh, when it came to making this video and trying out Flagship February. You know, so far this month, I've only been drinking Flagship products from every brewery I visit, from even, even from when I ended up at a bar the other weekend. I, I made sure to pick a local Flagship product off their menu. And I, and I have to tell you something, as a guy who normally is looking to check in something new on like Untapped or make a cool beer Instagram post and things like that, it's been kind of nice to just take a little break from having to dissect every single beer that's on a menu and, and pick out, you know, what's going to be appealing to not only me, but maybe some other folks out there who are interested in my opinion, if there are any. But instead, um, I, I'm only a, a week into February at the time I'm recording this, but, you know, it, it, instead, my experience has been one of, all right, I've got one, maybe two beers to pick from. Uh, I get in there, I pick the one I think I'm going to like better, and I really get to enjoy the moment more. I get to enjoy getting the beer and sitting down to it and just, just kind of tasting something easy drinking, a, a recipe that's been really refined, something a brewer really wants to showcase. You know, it's not something experimental they're trying out. No, this is something they've honed and refined and I, and I really get a, a great feel for what that brewery is about. And then I can learn the story behind the brewery and the brewer and, and it, and it it, it's fostered a little bit more of a moment than I kind of was expecting. Because, you know, a lot of times, drinkers like me, I'm definitely one of those crazy millennial drinkers that's trying 10 plus different types of beer a month. Um, well beyond that, actually. So, you know, for me to kind of sit down, take a minute to just limit myself a little bit, although I guess I haven't been doing a good job of that with four different beer reviews already, but 
you know, you know, limit myself at least a little bit. Put a box around my beer drinking experience to make it a little bit different than it normally is. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I'd highly recommend it to any hardcore beer nerds out there. Pick up some flagship brews. Remind yourself why these breweries are great. Connect with the brewers through the stories they tell with their flagship products. So, if you want to check out my adventures in flagship February, uh, you can check the link in the description below to the Beer by the Numbers Instagram page. I'm posting all the hashtag flagship February stuff there. Um, so that's been really enjoyable. Mm. And as I kind of wrap this video up, I, I, I think variety definitely is the spice of my life in the beer world, but I don't think I can blame anyone anymore for sticking to one or two beers or, or four or five breweries or anything like that. I don't think I don't think they're missing out like I kind of used to think. Uh, I think I think they're tapping into a completely different set of experiences of grow, really growing to know a brewer and a beer and the changes that happen and the nuances in there. And I think that's really cool. I'm not sure I'm gonna change my drinking habits forever. That's probably not gonna happen. But at least for a month, uh, this has been a really cool experience. So let me know your favorite flagship beer down in the comments section below. Please do, cause I want some more to try, I guess. And then, you know, if, if you are gonna try flagship February, I know this video is coming out in the middle of February, but uh, you know, if you wanna give it a shot, let me know your experience. You know, did ordering a beer become something easier for you, or did it provoke some anxiety that you might not get something you like? Let me let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. So once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next time with some more flagship beer content. Cheers. <laughs>